Welcome to another episode of the Catholic Novel. Today we're going to talk about Graham Greene's A Burnt Out Case, uh, a novel published in 1960. I read it at that time, and of course I reread it for this particular show. Uh, I, I, I don't, I'm sure of this. I've never read an essay on the Catholic novel that Graham Greene is not mentioned. He's almost synonymous with it. And that's why it's a little bit amusing that in interviews, Greene claimed he never wrote a Catholic novel. So my view is this. If Graham Greene didn't write a Catholic novel, <laughs> there is no such thing as a Catholic novel. I think what he meant was, he, 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 what he said was, I wrote novels in which the characters were Catholics. I think what he meant was, he wasn't proselytizing. He wasn't trying to uh, promote Catholicism. He was telling a story, which I think is very legitimate. And I would say the same thing about a number of the people we've, we've talked about. I say it about Walker Percy, for example. I say it about John Hassler, um, uh, Francois Moriac, all right? Now, um, a burnt out case. You know how I'm going to introduce this? I'm going to talk about five or six of the characters in the novel and then double back and talk about the themes. But let me say right away, I, I recently had an embarrassing experience with this novel. I run an adult education course on the Catholic novel and I, I give, there are four talks in the, in the spring, four talks in the fall. I give one in the fall and one in the spring and then I ask three of my friends who uh, love Catholic novels to give the talks, to, to, to take w some of the talks. Um, so I gave the talk on Burnt Out Case. And as we talked, I became aware that many of my friends saw more deeply into this novel than I did. They, they had insights, and I, and I think they were right, and I just missed it. Uh, I don't know why, maybe because I was rereading, and I, maybe I thought I understood it. There's, there's a lot, there's a great deal in this novel. The, the theme that I see in all Graham Greene's novels, I missed in this one, which is that God is a hound of heaven, pursuing the sinner. So to introduce us to it, I'm going to uh, just mention maybe six or seven of the characters in the novel, and then I'll double back and fill out the plot. So uh, Marie Riker is a young girl. She's married to a man considerably older than she is. He's a Catholic, she's a Catholic, but he's a really a strange Catholic. He spent some years in a Jesuit seminary, and he is all mixed up about sexuality, about St. Paul, about the sacraments, and so on. Uh, so she's trapped. She's really trapped. But as, you, as we begin to get to know her, in the, as we begin to see her in the novel, she seems, she seems emotionally very immature and, and maybe not that bright. But as the novel develops, uh, we discover she is quite a schema. And she's much more intelligent than we thought. And uh, she really is central to what, what happens, what the most important things that happen in the novel. Uh, so her husband's name is Riker, and as I've mentioned already, he thinks he's very pious. He thinks he's a, a devout Catholic. Um, I would say his view of sexuality is some strange combination of uh, Jansenism and paganism, okay? He, he just seems completely confused. I don't, think, I don't think he'd be a very good ad for any seminary, okay? So those are two of the characters. Another is Father Thomas. And he is probably the least attractive priest that Graham Greene has ever written about. He's extremely immature. He can't sleep at night unless there's a light in his room. Also, he seems to be incapable of, of lis listening or, li or incapable of hearing. Uh, he has these grandiose ideas about being a spiritual director. Uh, he thinks he, he can read, you know, read souls, identify saints, and so on. And even when people present to him evidence that is the opposite of what he's claiming it means, he goes right on claiming it. So, uh, he is, uh, I, I can't think of another priest in Graham Greene's writings who is so unattractive humanly. Then there's Dr. Colin, who is in charge of the leprosarium. Excuse me, I, I didn't say that. The whole, the whole novel takes place in a leprosari leprosarium. And Query, Q-U-E-R-R-Y, has gone there apparently to die, or certainly to, uh, to, to be hidden, not to be bothered anymore by his celebrity. He was a famous architect and something has, has something happened so that he, he sort of has retired from the human race. And he, the leprous army he's, he's living in, Dr. Colden is the uh, chief physician, and he's the one who uses the expression, a burnt out case. Now apparently with leprosy, a burnt out case is that the disease has taken everything possible from you. You're not dead, but you're about as close to being dead as you can be. And so there's kind of a parallel between what leprosy does to you physically and what seems to have happened to uh, Query 
emotionally and spiritually. So he, he was a Catholic, but he no longer goes to the sacraments. Uh, he doesn't seem to have any faith. Uh, he, and he doesn't, he doesn't seem to want to get involved at all with people. He just wants to be left alone, okay? And Father, um, Father Thomas won't leave him alone. And there's, a, there's also a newspaper man, uh, Parkinson, who is almost as bad as Father Thomas. He won't leave Quarry alone. Both of these characters are just trying to use him. And Riker, who's got these uh, somewhat pious ideas, he wants to use him too. So they are making it very difficult for Quarry to, you know, to be concealed, to be quiet, to be left alone. And then lastly, the father superior of the order that is involved in the uh, le leprosarium uh, is a terrific, terrific priest. He's a very happy man. He's a very, very intelligent man. And he's a perfect balance, a perfect ant antidote to, uh, to Father Thomas. Uh, now, uh, I, I, on another uh, show, I mentioned that I almost met Graham Greene, that we actually uh, were sitting next to one another in a restaurant. But when he saw me coming to sit, next, to sit near him, he turned his back on me. And uh, to this day, I regret that I didn't say something like, excuse me, Mr. Green, I know this is very rude, but you know you're sitting next to your most enthusiastic fan. I didn't do that. And probably it's, it's just as well I didn't, because if I did, I might, I might be in this novel. Uh, one interpretation of this novel is these characters are very similar to people who bothered Green when Power and the Glory and Heart of the Matter were big, big hits, uh, big, big uh, hits, and, and much discussion in the Catholic community. Uh, Green claims that all sorts of people came to him for spiritual direction and for theological problems, uh, which he felt completely inadequate to handle. So I want to, I want to read what he says of how these, how these characters were created. He, he says they were created by the people who expected all sorts of things from him, and all he was was a novelist. He wrote stories. He wasn't the pope, he wasn't a bishop, he wasn't a priest. So uh, this is a quote then from Green. <clears throat> In the years between the heart of the matter and the end of the affair, I felt myself used and exhausted by the victims of religion. The vision of faith as an untroubled sea was lost forever. It was more like a tempest in which the lucky were engulfed and lost, and the unfortunate survived to be flung battered and bleeding on the shore. What a, what a horrible view of religion, okay? A better man could have found a life's work on the margin of that cruel sea, but my own course of life gave me no confidence in any aid I might, I might proffer. I had no apostolic mission, and the cries for spiritual assistance maddened me because of my impotence. What was the church for but to aid these sufferers? What was the priesthood for? I was like a man without medical knowledge in a village struck with plague. It was in those years, I think, that Quarry was born and Father Thomas too. He had often sat in that chair of mine and he had worn many faces. Okay, so uh, t Father Thomas and Quarry are, are, are based on people whom Green met through his celebrity. And so if I, if, I had, if I had spoken to him in that restaurant that time, there might have been a Father Robert in this novel, okay? So now what's the interpretation of it? Well, I, I, would, I would stick with my basic approach now, having, having discussed this with a class of people who I thought had terrific insights. It seems like Query is either in limbo or purgatory. Uh, he's not, he is not yet spiritually ready to be welcomed into heaven, but he's basically a good person. He just wants to be left alone. Uh, one of the natives, uh, incidentally, named Deo Gracias, and maybe that's a little bit, maybe the symbolism there is a little bit heavy, thanks be to God, uh, is uh, seriously hurt one evening and in danger of dying. And Query, on his own, goes out with great danger to himself and spends the night with the native, really saving his life. Uh, it seems to me it's, it's a kind of a... Uh, Hero an act of heroic charity, though Query would, would object to that completely. And certainly, uh, as the novel is written, Query is not thinking of Christ when he goes and helps this, this person. But the fact is, he does go and help this person. So uh, as the novel develops, uh, through a series of circumstances, Query's celebrity becomes known. And he's completely innocent, but he's accused 
of impregnating Riker's wife. And of course, Riker is, is absolutely crushed. This man he thought was a saint, uh, apparently had sexual relations with his wife, which he didn't, which Query did not have. And Father Thomas finally realizes, to some extent, how wrong he was. I, I, there were parts in the, in the uh, novel I thought were awfully funny. When someone, for example, when someone says, well, Query, how can Query be a saint? You know, he seems like a dead man. And then Father Thomas says, well, that's the dark night of the soul. So, so whenever anybody disagrees with him or offers what I would take pretty strong evidence, he's able to twist it and, and continue with his own position until he hears uh, the rumor, the false rumor, that Query has impregnated Riker's wife. Uh, okay, so the, uh, my, my question at, at the end of, of all these kind of novels is, is a Query redeemed? Is Query saved? Uh, is query, query some kind of a, uh, is, is being a burnt out case, an example in this novel of you've lost everything and now the Holy Spirit can enter your life. Uh, am I reading into this? Am I, I don't think so. Uh, I think the people in my class of the Catholic novel have helped me to at least suspect this, at least see this, because it, it's typical green. You know, it, uh, there, there must be, within it because of his, his uh, vision of faith and his writing and so on, there's got to be this other dimension. And I think, I think in rereading it again after the class, uh, it's there. It is there, okay? Um, so I, I'm, I'm, I think this one, I, I think I should read it again. And I think if you're going to read it, maybe read it with a pen or a pencil and just make mental notes of, of what you think are, are pointers, signs. Uh, like there's one point uh, where I, I think it's the doctor who says it, or someone says it, that once you're a burnt out case, then you're ready for some kind of a cure. It's almost like the disease has to go to the extreme. And of course, some writers in the spiritual life would say that. You know, there's a line in, in uh, The Hound of Heaven by Francis Thompson, and I can't quote it exactly, but the idea is this, you must burn the wood before you can write with it, before you can write with the, with the burnt wood. And that's the impression I'm getting here, that there are certain souls, certain human beings who are called to terrific suffering, uh, a sense of abandonment. And it, when they, if they can accept that and surrender, perhaps, perhaps the Holy Spirit rushes in. Uh, you know, the most recent c case we, I know of is Mother Teresa. She apparently, if we go by her diaries, she apparently had no feeling toward God for 35 years, and yet, uh, she continued to pick up the lepers in Calcutta. She continued to, to wash their bodies. She continued to go to Mass every day and so on. You know, when that came out, excuse me, after Mother Teresa's death, one of my friends said Mother Teresa was a hypocrite. No, you know, she, she, she did what she really believed she should do, though she didn't feel like doing it. Now, is that what's going on with Query? I don't know. You, you, you read the novel, and then you can tell me. <laughs>